Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really nice to be with you guys. Uh, unfortunately, it's not in person, but at least we can communicate. Uh, well, that phrase, uh, what I mean with that phrase, it's not my phrase, it's a phrase that uh, an old violinist, friend of my dad, from the Teatro Colón, the Opera Orchestra in Buenos Aires, told, mentioned to a very good friend of mine, violinist, and said to him, you know, he was a young lad, said, and he was an old man, said, you know, Raul, what we do, playing live music, is like writing in the water. Uh, and Raul said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, you go to a concert, you play something, you hear something, and that's gone. That's gone. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do. You know, when you go to a concert, you play two notes. For some people, those two notes were amazing. For some people, probably were not amazing. For me, probably were fantastic. But everyone has their own perception of those two, three notes. But you cannot replicate, you cannot emulate what happened in that platform during that half an hour, one hour, two hours. It's gone. You come out of a concert, you can discuss, you can talk about it, but you can always not, never go back. It's like someone trying to write in a river. You write the word, as soon as you finish one letter, it's gone, it's passed. Mm -hmm. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah, no, it's fascinating. Um, I suppose it's, it's a lesson to us all that we need to live in the moment. And yeah, just really enjoy and, it. and live in the moment, but also live music, that was his live music all about, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's something yeah. that stays in our minds, in the memories, yeah. forever. Yeah, yeah. You know, I have incredible memories, and I think I, I forgot a, a lot of things in my life, our concerts I went to, here, but a lot of them, they're still there. Still Moments, yeah. phrases, you know, and, and that's so important. And it's something you can only talk about it. You can discuss it. You cannot criticize because nobody has the same idea of what mm -hmm. nobody could realize what you're talking about. But it's here and here in your heart. And it's, I think it's fascinating that. Yeah, I think it's yeah. a really good phrase. Oh, that's great. Well, I'm gonna, I'm going to take you back now, Eduardo, to yeah. Buenos Aires, Argentina, and and the young Eduardo. Uh, the child, Eduardo, and what do you remember? What's your first musical memory? Well, I mean, my, my, my dad was a double bass player in the opera orchestra in the Teatro Colón in Buenos Aires. And also he was a tango player. For, that, for, for me, I grew up since I was born listening to music. My house was music, music means my dad used to always radio on and I used to go to the operas, the, the operas in Buenos Aires used to do open air concerts in the summer. I used to go when I was three, four years old already to hear operas and concerts in the park there. And for me, music was just, I never questioned it. It was part of our life in the family and my life as well. It's part of my life. It's like I was uh, my my cello, my first cello teacher used to talk about. They say, if you start so young, it's like brushing your teeth. Nobody question about brushing teeth. You go before going to bed, you brush your teeth. You, you know, it's part of your life. It's part of going and have breakfast. It's like having a meal. For me, that music was all up like that in my house, mm -hmm. and was never a, a something outside. Outside was inside the house as well. Mm -hmm. Lovely. It's time for your first piece of music, Eduardo. So, what have you chosen and why? Okay, could you remind me which I chose? Because I don't, <laughs> I haven't got the email here. I, no problem, no problem. Um, you have to, well, we're going to hear. Uh, yes. well, it's, it's on the screen there now. Yeah, 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 of so, course. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it has to well, be, really, doesn't it? The cello suites, yeah. the Bach cello well, suites. Like, yeah. Um, played well. by Pablo Casals, and we're going to hear the prelude. Yes. You want me to talk about it now? Thank you. 
called Cello Suite. So, um, yes, if you can explain why you chose it. Um, well, for, for me, it's probably one of the first things I heard on the cello playing. You know, uh, I remember my dad buying, coming home with all the Bach suites recorded by Casals. And in those days, the suites were not well known. Casals just recorded them and nobody knew them. He was the only person who knew those suites. He found them, he studied for 10 years before the, the recording, and Casals was at his peak. And, and that was up for everybody. It was just like, wow, what is this? You know, uh, it was just something so simple. And also because it's a, it's one of the first pieces everybody learned because it's G major, it's quite easy to play in the first position. But play like that, you need so much skills and it just touched your heart. And for many, 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 many years, those versions, that version was the top version. Everybody just, that was a benchmark. Of course, people start moving on from there and, and went away and the Baroque specialists came, came and everything changed, the taste, musical taste changed. But now, we discover after all we did in a big circle, we're going back and it's very similar what we're doing now is what Casal used to do say sixty years ago. Yeah. And it's amazing yeah. what he does there. You know, it's just notes, but what he does, the direction he does with those notes. So natural, so beautiful play. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't think I've actually ever sat down and listened to the Casals version, but it made me cry. I mean it's, well, it's I tell so you, beautiful. I, I was I haven't had it for for, for a bit now. And I just hear it like that now. It's just it's pure music. I remember when he recorded, nobody heard him before. Well, now every new recording, you have like 60, 100, 100 recordings to compare and to choose and to analyze and to check check the speed. I like this one better, I like the version. But he didn't. He just had a manuscript yeah. because he found them. And he said, let's see what's all about. He studied for 10 years before he did that recording. But that shows. The, 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 the skillful and the, and the musicality of that guy was amazing. Yeah, no, amazing. So, um, the cello, um, was it always going to be the cello for you? Or did you ever consider a different instrument? Or <laughs> but because I, I don't remember because I was, I was six years old. Okay. Right. And the only thing I remember, my dad said once to me, would you like to study the cello? Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, yeah. Obviously, obviously, I make a comment while really going to consult, I, I was attracted to this instrument. Uh, anyway, that was one day. Three days later, I have a really nice cello waiting in my house my dad bought for me. Uh -huh. And uh, three days later, I have my first lesson with a, a fantastic teacher who actually make me fall in love with this instrument never look back for me cello was that natural for me and i never looked back i knew when i was seven eight years old that that's what i want to do the rest of my life never had any question whatsoever to do something else really really i never did, you know uh, I, I i gave up the the, the school the, the what we call secondary school three years earlier because I had really? enough. I mean, I just wanted to work. I wanted to play cello. I was playing quite well by that time. You know, I was not well, but I was, I was already kind of, I was a professional. Mm -hmm. and, but, uh, but I didn't want to go to school. Anyway, what I did, my dad said, okay, you can give up school, but you have to do the school uh, privately. What I did, I had a few teachers coming here and there. And at the end of the year, I did all the exams. That's how I finished my secondary school. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, because I, I was working since I was 13 years old with the cello. Wow. And all my friends since I was 10, 9, they were friends from the music world. And then I have very good friends from school still, and I'm still in touch with them. But my main, my core group of friends, they're all musicians. Yeah. And for that, it was just music was taking me from one step to another. I knew what I wanted to do next. I, next and one thing took another, and I never, I never looked back. And, if, and I'll, I'll complain about the profession because we all complain about the profession. We are badly paid. We have to practice every day. It's not, you know, it, it is quite, in a way, terrible profession. We say terrible, but it's not. We love it. I wouldn't change it. If you're Istanbul, if you're born again, I would do the same thing. No doubt wow. about it. Wow. Okay. So, no doubts then. So, it's time for your second track, um, which is the Brahms string sextet in B flat, the second movement which we're going to hear. So we'll play it and then I'll, I'll ask you why you chose it, Eduardo.
Okay, so um, why was that your second choice? <laughs> because this music is absolutely amazing. This music is, is string playing and how well written for strings. That tune, you know, it kind of a beautiful legato tune against the, those chords, you know, who give that kind of bouncy, kind of walking uh, idea with the most beautiful melody on top. That's a tune after that variation coming up. I think it's, it's a masterpiece of music. And Brahms, although he was kind of a, not the easiest composer for us, technical because he wrote everything think of the piano for string playing is unbelievable all those phrases long 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 eight bar phrases you know you can beat that and every time i hear that piece every time i play that piece there's something so special about it because it's simple but on the other hand it's just touch something that no other piece for me to touch it you know it's just fantastic don't, yeah. don't you think it's amazing? Do you know that? Do you know that piece? Or for no, you no, I don't. I, I, it's funny. I've come to Brahms quite late in life um, because I. Well, I it's up, never too late. No, no, I can see that now. Um, but my my dad wasn't a massive fan of Brahms, and I, yes, he um, played me everything when I was younger. But I, not not so much Brahms. But I, yeah, I, I really because, love it. Yeah, you know, it's string quartet. It's a fantastic musical uh, uh, balance to the music group and sonority, but. String sextet is amazing because it sounds like a, like a, an orchestra, a string orchestra. It's only six mm -hmm. people there. So well written. Yeah. Real time and with sounds, yeah. The whole sextet is unbelievable. I recommend oh, both. There are two sextet, G major and that one, B minor. I, and actually, I really recommend it to you because it's I mean, three flat major. I, I recommend it because it's unbelievable music. And, and it's always a great pleasure. Very challenging to play, but it's a great pleasure. It's a, it's a, it's a big piece for us. Yeah, for stream players yeah no it's wonderful yeah yeah so taking you back to your your life story eduardo so what was it like moving from south america to europe how, how old were you when you actually moved over to, to 18 first time? just 18 18 yeah. 18 and it was a uh, i mean you <laughs> It's not like, like it is now, you know, I always tell my students, you know, uh, we didn't have emails, we didn't have internet, we didn't have anything, you know, we, when I, I remember also in Argentina, I left Argentina in 1980, I was really young, 18 years old in many ways, in many ways I was a professional, I, 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 very I was very independent in my house and all that, but I never left the country, the first time I left the country, just to take an aer aeroplane to go to Switzerland, uh, I left, I remember Buenos Aires was 36 degrees, middle of February, and I got minus 18 in Switzerland <laughs> in, in less than 24 hours, you know, and it was a telephone calls were, were really, really expensive. We were talking to, I met a friend of mine who we were living together as a student there, and we just remind, remember each other, remind each other that the telephone call was so expensive. We, we would not eat a week if we would have to do a telephone call those days. Uh, also because it was difficult to communicate with home because the letters, we were living in the, the dictatorship in Argentina, still the junta was there, and everybody who was sending letters to Argentina uh, was, was a, not considered a terrorist, but they were, they were worried that they were, you were a terrorist and they will open the letters and they will read the letters. And the letters my parents had said to me, <laughs> they always, always came open. Obviously, somebody had a great time during my my <laughs> 18 years old to my parents, but it wasn't easy. It was a complete cultural shock. But I was I was ready because I, the last five six years of, of since I was 12 13, my teacher I was talking. When you go to Europe, you will do this. When you go to Europe, you know, in Argentina we have a very very big uh, European tradition, and everybody everybody all the students, all the teachers study in Europe we have a lot of Europeans there in Buenos Aires it's very cosmopolitan very European I come from Italian family but we have very big connections with Europe for Europe for us was just the place to go and 18 years old I was just I was loving it you know just mm -hmm. for me it was just a fantastic time and I loved it I have a great time uh, I didn't miss home but badly like a lot of people did uh, I just got on with it I always get on with it I, and it was great great experience for me and um, i always recommend it to anybody travel 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 go somewhere else make the experience live in a place where they don't speak the language learn how to survive and it's something i, I learned how to survive there when i was 
Switzerland was an easy country to arrive, you know, in the middle of the mountains. Uh, it was a great experience. And not meeting Menwe in there, Menwe, Yehudi Menwe, was great because he used to play with us a lot. We used to tour with him. And that was something, you know, for, for a young guy, you know, you hear Yehudi Menwe, Yehudi Menwe Sali, he's in the same room with you and talking to you and, and, and having a meal with you. And that's very special. Yeah, no, it sounds absolutely wonderful, Eduardo, and a great, a great experience. So it's time it for your third, your third track, which is also Brahms. Yeah. Uh, the fourth symphony, the first movement. So we'll hear it and then we'll talk about why you've chosen it. So, um, why that particular piece of Brahms? Uh, that probably was the first Brahms symphony I played when I was probably 16 years old. And that piece for me means quite a lot. I, I, it's a very emotional piece for me. And also it's amazing how a man could build this amazing melody with just intervals. It's absolutely nothing. It's just intervals. You know, skills of that guy, the, the feel of that guy, just intervals. It's not a simple melody. He just creates the melodies with intervals. And I have to feel, start filling out the gaps. But that's his introduction, that's the beginning. And he builds all that, these incredible colors and the tensions he creates with the. With the uh, take you from one note to another with just tension, creating tension, just with the with with the, with, the, with the chords, with the, with the with the distances. I think it's just, just incredible. It's it's like coming from somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, I, I I'm I'm in awe of any composer because uh, I just think it's amazing being able to actually, you know, produce music like that. But yeah, that's fascinating. But the, the delicacy of starting a symphony like that, you know, it's just. It just keep you in the air, keep you floating. Yeah. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not ground. It's just floating. It's just with a lot of inspiration. It's just pure, pure inspiration, pure love, pure, you know, life to, to live, life to love. You know, it's just fantastic. Yeah, no, very lifting. Beautiful. Um, so uh, you went back to Buenos Aires for a while, but then you came back to Europe permanently. Um, first to Switzerland, then to Germany, and you became active in the field of contemporary music. Um, yeah. So just tell us a bit about that. Well, I mean, I, I, I always did contemporary music. I always been involved with contemporary in Buenos Aires. I was con involved with a lot of a, a group of composers who, you know, avant-garde, always avant-garde. I love avant-garde music. And in Argentina, I was very, very, very prominent that Argentina, Paris was always a big connection, you know. Uh, and I was involved. I loved playing contemporary music. And I did all my youth playing contemporary music. When I go to Germany, in Switzerland, I didn't do much because it was all kind of more string playing and all uh, string, uh, baroque, romantic, nothing much 20th century. But when I went to Germany, we, we go with a group of friends and we said, OK, we, we need to start doing something contemporary, you know, really, really avant-garde. Uh, we formed a group. Uh, it went very well, and with a lot of concerts, we brought a lot of 
Latin American music, a lot of Italian music, and I was very eclectic group, and we call it the NC, WNC, because, because it was close. We never close. That was the idea of the group. We never close. WNC. It's like, <laughs> that was a, the title of a group. And of course, we were students, and after we, we finished studying, everybody got jobs in different places, and the group disintegrated. But we were very, we did a lot of new commissions. We did the, it was a very, very nice thing to do, you know. And I, I always, always uh, encourage my students to get involved, get involved in contemporary music. It's so important. Otherwise, music will stagnate. We need to play contemporary music. We need to get the, the, the flavor of it. Otherwise, we always be playing Brahms and Beethoven, because actually I love them and nothing wrong with that. But we need to broaden the, the spectrum. And, and also for the public point of view, we need to bring new public and we have to show the public that actually we are not afraid to play new things. Like any new thing, sometimes you commit to play something and you realize it's not as good as you thought, or the other way around, you thought it's not going to be great and suddenly it's a fantastic piece of music, but you never know until you do it. <laughs> but it has to be done, and somebody has to do it. And I think it's uh, so important for us, I mean, I'm, I'm not young anymore, but for young players just to get involved, to get their hands dirty, try, talk to composers, teach the composer, help the composers, you know, and, and, and experiment, why not? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I try and encourage people not to think of music by any particular genre. Just if absolutely. It you, if it moves you, then it's, you know. It's, that was music it's, it's about, you know, well. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, when they go to cinema, we, uh, I used to love Westerns. I love everything, you know, Second World War films, you know, violent films, you know, I like anything, psychological thrillers. I like everything, you know, you kind of say, no, I only like Westerns. If it's not Western, I don't go to a cinema. You know, in a way, you are, lo you are losing out. Nobody else is losing out. You are losing out. I think it's important just to widen the thing. Yeah. Well, we, we need to actually move on to your fourth piece, Eduardo. Um, yeah. Now, interestingly, uh, our previous guest, Catherine, also chose this piece. So it's obviously a piece that um, uh, yeah. is, going to, is going to move a lot of people. Yeah. Um, it's the um, Marla Second Symphony Resurrection. Um, and it's the la part of the last movement. Um, so yeah, let's let's hear it. I've said that this, the first thing I'm going to do after lockdown is try and find um, a live performance of that. I'm well, I, I recommend you one. In YouTube, yeah, yeah. you want an amazing recording with Simon Rattle, the CBSO, uh -huh. in oh, Symphony Hall. When we, op was when we opened Symphony Hall, it was unbelievable. It's still one of the best recordings ever. Okay. You, you will see me with, white, with uh, black hair. You will oh, not no. recognize me. <laughs> But it was 1990. It, it okay. still is in Facebook and on YouTube, and it's fantastic. And everybody t still talk about that version. Oh right, okay. Well, um, yeah, I, I couldn't find that version, but I, yes, 
Yeah, no, but I've got at least I've got Simon Rattle on there. But yeah, look at YouTube uh, uh, okay. for CBSO and, and this, this is amazing. Okay. What can I say about the, this piece? You know, yeah. it, it, uh, it got everything. You know, you work in there for an hour and a half. You know, really heavy passages, difficult, really tricky for the child or for everybody. And so you reach this last movement, who's actually, I don't know, it's, it's, it's to do with death, with forgiveness, and with resurrection. And it gives you hope, it gives you sadness, but basically it gives you hope. And, and you know, it is, it is missing, especially these days, you know, when you listen to something like that, it brings you out of your comfort zone emotionally, and, and, and it's, it's so easy to cry with the end of this piece. And you know, the last, the, even you don't have to know anything about the music, or you don't have to know about anything, the, the, the text. You know the last paragraph, the, 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 the quiet sings, is, Die shall I in order to live. Rise again, yes, rise again. Will you? My heart, in an instant. That's for which you suffered. To go, to God, shall it carry you. Yeah. yeah, it's rising stuff, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's amazing. It's just yeah. and, and 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 you know the soprano comes on top of the you, you hear in that version because it was before that you have this choir. So the soprano goes on top of the choir. It's you feel in heaven. You feel mm -hmm. if 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 you don't believe in heaven when you hear that piece, you, you might doubt about it. <laughs> you might think mm -hmm. might be heaven. And for us, for me especially, and for a lot of my my. Friends, uh, this is very special piece because we did it with Simon's uh, opening opening Symphony Hall, last concert with Simon in the in Symphony Hall with him, mm -hmm. uh, last concert with Andres Nelson as well, and mm -hmm. he always have kind of a farewell farewell feeling, but hope. Yeah, there is something else there. Yeah, well, it's very appropriate for now, isn't it? Yeah, Definitely. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we it need is. A bit of hope at the moment. Uh, we need, we need a bit of hope. We need, yeah. Yeah. Um. So, um, what I was going to ask you, Eduardo, is I know you, obviously you you've got children who are musicians. Of course, we we know Diego. Um. And do, do you have others who are also musicians? I can't. I can't. Yeah, remember. I got uh, Danny. Danny is uh, younger. Yeah. Danny got is twenty months younger than Diego. And he's oh, a right. double bass player. Oh right. Okay. Yeah, okay. he's a double yeah, bass player. Yeah. But, uh, also. Full. Nearly the full string quartet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We got Kathy plays the viola. My wife plays oh, the viola. Oh, right. Oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah, oh, but lovely. Uh, yeah, Danny, Danny, Diego's a violinist. You know Diego. He's he's mm -hmm. in Berlin. He's working in Berlin. He's uh -huh. he wants to stay there. He was working for two and a half years in the Deutsche Oper. As he freelance everywhere in Germany, and he's uh -huh. very happy there. He loves his life in Berlin. He's having a great time there. Oh, and Danny, the little crazy. one, just went. The little one went to to Berlin and just to see, want to try a bit of Germany and the lockdown came up for that. He spent six months doing nothing, but now he got uh, he's going for a master's in Munich. The race oh, in Munich, he's starting oh, next wonderful. week. Wonderful, yeah, that's great. That's really great. Um, and was it the same for them as it was for you? Was it just that music was just such a part of their life that they... Well, we, 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 we Kathy, with my wife, we try our best not to... <laughs> Not to have musicians in the family anymore, but uh, <laughs> but the kids the kids learn they learn Diego learned violin since he was really young, and Danny learned the, the double bass as well since he was very young. Mm -hmm. But that was we never thought they were going to follow uh, music. Mm -hmm. Diego because he, Diego is, is a is very Diego's very bright and and he have a lot of interests. He likes philosophy. He likes computing. He likes you know a lot of things. He's very. We, I thought he was going to be a journalist. Journalist, uh, and. And but one day he was he was having lessons with Peter Thomas. He always have a good teacher. That's the main thing for us. We always give them a good tuition, and they have a lot of respect, and they always practicing and they're doing well. But one day he went to a youth orchestra, CBSO youth orchestra. He was I remember it was he was like 14, 15. and and he went in the CBSO youth orchestra. They doing the course in half term. He was doing school. He was doing all this activity half term. He had to go to the orchestra six hours a day, the whole week. So that would put him off. Mm -hmm. The third day he came back say, Dad, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. Oh. I said, okay, fine. And then you have to take it seriously. <laughs> he mm -hmm. said, okay, yes. He said, I'm, I'm going to be 16 soon. He said, uh, I got two years. Let me really give it a good go now. If I don't get into college, I do something else. 
he got into the Royal Northern College of Music. He did four years there. And after he went to Berlin, he did very well. Oh, well, it and Danny, graceful. and Danny, the little one, he, he was yeah, a, yeah. he was a great footballer. That's my disappointment. He because he was a great footballer, oh. <laughs> and he wanted to play football. He wanted to play football, and he was he's very gifted. Play double, he plays uh, drums, uh, electric guitar. Diego plays electric guitar as well. They both have jazz lessons since he was very young. Danny plays bass guitar very well, and so he said, "Danny, I want to play football." But, uh, he was doing very well in football locally here, but he said, "I don't want to play in England. I want to play in Argentina." Yeah, wow okay okay fine and then we he went to argentina he tried for a club there he got accepted mm -hmm. he gave up school here <laughs> very similar to me he, he finished a levels and left i left the country to live with his grandmother in argentina when he was 16. Uh -huh. and playing football every week and every i mean uh, every sunday but he was training every day very seriously and he loved it. He had the best two years of his life, he said. But by the end of that, by the last five, six months, he got into a lot of tango players. He 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 met a few tango players there and he started playing tango with the double bass, like my dad. Mm -hmm. And suddenly discovered that music was his thing. Okay. And then he ran me up, spoke to Kathy, and 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 Kathy said, Well, you have to tell your dad about it, because I was going to be more disappointed than him. Anyway, he gave up uh, he came here, he went to uni, finished, managed, managed to do A-level very quickly, went to uni, got a master's in Manchester, and now he's doing a master's in, in Munich. Oh. He was a great footballer. What a shame. I would say, how are you going to give football for the double base? That's crazy. You know? uh, oh, well, it sounds like you've, they're both very sensible boys. And well, yeah, yeah, I think that they're learning the, you know, it's, it's very difficult time for youngsters in the music yeah. now. Yeah. But you cannot stop them, and they, they don't care about money. They are very, they live what they got, what they have got. They haven't got expensive taste. They like their own music, and why not? Go for it. I did it. Go for it. Yeah. Good. Well, actually, talking about tango, it's time for your fifth choice. Um, which I, well, is it pronounced tro Troilo? Troilo, Troilo. Aníbal Troilo. Um, yeah, so should we hear it, and then we can talk about okay. it? Yeah. Did you choose that piece? Eduardo? I choose that piece. I choose that piece because I choose a hundred of these pieces, a uh, hundred of these tangos. Uh, basically, because uh, this is part of me. I grew up with it. My dad was a great tango player. All it I knew since I was a kid. All the tango players that come to my house for meals, for drinks, and I knew everybody. I did play tango. I grew up with tango players. Uh, this music for me is my past. I my my present in my future. I, I, that's me, you know, I hear this music, I could see Buenos Aires, I could see the avenue when I grew up. I grew up in the middle of the center of Buenos Aires, a city of 10 million people. Uh, and I could, I, I, I could see Buenos Aires when I see there. And my dad used to always have the radio on during the night. I don't know how my mom so could cope with that. He would have the radio on non-stop, the whole night, while he was sleeping. And if you go and, and switch it off, say, don't switch it off, I'm listening. <laughs> I, but he was always, but he always have tangos, 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 and we can all hear from our bedrooms the tangos, and and this is one of the classic. And uh, Aníbal Troilo is is like it's the sugar of the tango, you know. He's a, he was a great bandoneon player. He was he has this amazing orchestra in the sixties. It's the golden age of orchestra, typical orchestras like that, and he got everything, got rhythm, got poetry, he got amazing phrasing, uh, music. You know, it's just. It's so, so sensible, you know, so mm. sensitive, not sensitive, sensitive. And for me, it's, it's my music, uh, 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 it's my music, my background, that's where I'm coming from. 
you know yeah. uh, i grew up with that i come from buenos aires and that's our music mm. yeah i mean I'm, i've never been to buenos aires or, or south america in fact but it is but you're right it's very evocative isn't it you it's can very evocative. imagine you can imagine two people just doing the tango in a nightclub somewhere yeah well um, that was all about yeah. and that was a golden age where people used to go and dance in in the in the bars you know and and now it's more sophisticated of course you don't have that anymore but those days in the 60s uh people used to do that and would be one orchestra after another until six o'clock in the morning every day mm. yeah <laughs> yeah no it's amazing well actually while we're, while we're on the subject of of tango we might as well play your sixth record um, yeah. um and i this is the only one where i've, I've included a picture eduardo on the slides which we'll see in a moment Ah! I, I recognise that person in the middle there, <laughs> so I couldn't resist it. I'm afraid. No, but, why not? Um, this is obviously your group. <laughs> yeah, this, this is my group. Yeah, yeah. yeah I got a tango group, and I was I was quite reluctant to do my own tango. I do a lot of tango. I play a lot of tango here, but never my group. And and Mark Gucci, the guy on the right, the bass player mm -hmm. from the orchestra always said to me, he's a great jazzer and great musician, he's a double bass player from the CBSO. He, he always said, we have to do tango groups. Oh, Mark, it's difficult. We haven't got a bandoneon, who's a typical instrument for the, for the tango. We haven't got one in England. He said, well, we have to find a way. And many, many, many tools we were discussing and listening. He was listening a lot of tango music. And he said to me one day, I think we can manage without the bandoneon. We can try to imitate the sound with the flute and the sax. And that will, we might try. And he started doing this arrangement. And that was, that was our first CD. It was actually, I think it's a masterpiece, what Mark did there. Uh, the arrangement, they're all missing by Astro Piazzolla, who, uh, I don't know, you know about Tango Piazzolla, the king of tango. Piazzolla yeah, took the yeah, tango. Been, yeah, but, yeah. Okay, the, the orchestra you had before, Troilo Orchestra, mm -hmm. Piazzolla used to play when he was very young in Troilo's orchestra. Uh -huh. And he did a lot of arranging for that orchestra. That was his first professional job. My dad played with Piazzolla and his octet. The first, when Piazzolla broke from the classical tango, he did something really eclectic. My dad was with him. For I knew Piazzolla since I was born. And, and Piazzolla for me is, is, is what can I say, he just took the tango to, mm -hmm. uh, it's a Miles Davis of, of the jazz, is Piazzolla, you know. He, mm -hmm. also he could, he could, he's a great, not only a great player, but he's always a great uh, composer. It's a bit like Gershwin. He can compose a melody out of nothing. Mm -hmm. And if you are going to put Invierno now, Inverno, which actually Invierno means winter, from Buenos Aires, Porteño is from Buenos Aires, it's like Cockney, Buenos Aires, okay? Cockney, winter. I mean, Invierno from Buenos Aires. And it's just, it's just it's dark, it's, it's oh, it's, you see, that melody is only, few people could write melody like with so little. I hope you enjoy it. Oh. Oh, brilliant yeah no i found i found it quite easily that recording on apple music so I, yeah, like you say i imagine it's quite easily found yeah yeah um, it's amazing yeah, music yeah. it makes music and and piazzolla for, for me is one of the greatest composers of the 20th century oh. uh, he wrote a lot of music he wrote a lot of classical music as well he wrote a, 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 a few quartets for the chronos quartet in new york 
quite modern. And that, that's his manuscript. If you see the music there, the yellow thing, that is one of his manuscripts. Okay. That is, is a museum piece, and I keep it because he gave it to me. Oh. Not even his widow knows I got it. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> and yeah, he was a fa family friend and a great. Mm. I mean, for me, it's that, that, those melodies, you know, to be able to create a melody and not feel like with three notes, it's just amazing. Yeah, yeah. As I say, I'm always in awe of composers. It's absolutely wonderful. Well, we, um, we're now going to open it out to questions, Eduardo, because believe Good. it or not, um, yeah, the t time has passed very quickly. Um, so, yeah, um, if anybody would like to ask Eduardo a question, please fire away. I'll ask, I'll ask a question. Oh, hang on, they're coming up now. Paul's, Paul's got one. <laughs> What's your favourite cello concerto to play, Eduardo? Vorstek. No doubt about it. The Vorstek cello concerto for me is amazing. It's the best cello concerto ever written. I mean, got everything. The tutis are like symphony. Uh, the cello part is incredible written, challenging, basically. I, I think it brings the cello at his best. Mm -hmm. Well, Paul says the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask, have you got any wind players in your family or, or are you all string players? Yes, yes, my sister, my sister is an oboe player. She plays the oboe professionally in Argentina. Wow. Yeah, we got the, yeah, she's, she's a black sheep of the family. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, only my sister, yeah. And I got, I got my, my, my nephew from Kathy's side, he's a percussionist in the UK. Oh, yeah. And he's married to a piccolo player from the BBC Scott, BBC Wales. Mm. And we got, from that side of the family, we got a bit of wind. Yeah, I think Rachel had a question. Can you dance the tango? No, no, I'm a terrible dancer. <laughs> no, I'm a terrible dancer. I, I, I hate dancing. I just hate <laughs> dancing. You know, for me, for me, it's, I just love listening to music and, and it does sound terrible. My dad used to say, my dad used to say, if you play, you cannot dance. <laughs> and I cannot dance, I'm dreadful dancing. My wife always complains because we go to a party, say, let's go dance. No, I don't like dancing. Oh, goodness sake, just dance. I just don't like dancing. Sorry, I'm really, I haven't got any rhythm, you see, that's the problem. I'm a cello player, no rhythm. <laughs> It's interesting, isn't it? But yeah, it's like some comedians yeah. are very quiet, apparently. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> tango is very difficult to dance. My my mom used to dance very well. My dad was a disaster. My mom, my mom, my mom dances very well. But I can't, mm. I can't dance. No. It's, mm. it's just it's too too difficult. It's it's always the one that seems to pull everyone down on Strictly, isn't it? The, uh, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> the, the, the Argentinian tango, the Argentinian tango, yeah, it's very tricky, yeah. Yeah. It's very tricky. Eduardo, can you tell us about your cello? Uh, well, yeah, I got I got five or six cellos. Uh, I tell you a bit of a story about my cellos. Uh, I I always play. Uh, my uncle, my uncle, who married my uh, my auntie, my my mum's sister, was Italian violin maker from Cremona. Okay. He immigrated to Argentina in the 60s and he met my auntie and they married anyway. He was a violin maker and I always play instruments made by him. Uh, he was a great violin maker and I got four, I got four or five made by him. Uh, when my uncle died in 1990, he left in the family a fantastic instrument, an Italian instrument, a 17... 85, 82, 1782, made in Naples. It's a, it's a, a Galliano, Galliano, and I got it here with me. And we, I bought it. I bought to my cousins and niece, I bought. I bought the cello from them, and I have massive restoration work. And I got it here. I show it to you if you want to see it. It's a. It's a. Neapolitan instrument, <laughs> 1782. Wow. wow. And this is, is my cello now. I use, I use the modern cellos as well. I got the other one here. One, the other one. This is, this is, by, this is made by my uncle. Wow. 
It's a beautiful instrument. Mm -hmm. And Diego, Diego plays violins made. Diego plays violin made by my uncle. Mm -hmm. The last two violins, when he died, he left two violins just made, and Diego got them and Diego plays them. That his main his main instrument. Okay. We've had uh, one or two more questions. Uh, so Paul, Paul has been asking what you've been up to during lockdown and what, what plans you've got coming up next. Uh, well, well, we did the lockdown. I, don't know, I probably you don't know about it, but I was very ill. Oh, I no. was. <laughs> I, I, got, I got it in the beginning of March. Oh, gosh. Right. I mean, the orchestra, we were like 15 people in the orchestra who got it at the same time. I think right. Mirga, our conductor, brought it to us. It actually not, wasn't her fault. He came to work with us for a week, for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I had a chat with her on a Friday, quite close. And next day she canceled and I started mm -hmm. feeling bad. And I was, mm -hmm. uh, of course, I was isolated here with Kathy. We both feeling rough and my temperature went up quite high, but I was okay for 10 days. I was absolutely mm -hmm. okay for the, but suddenly it went to my lungs. Mm -hmm. And that was it. I, I couldn't breathe ambulance, paramedics, urgent to hospital, and uh, uh, diagnosed with pneumonia, acute pneumonia. Wow. And that was uh, the 17th of, uh, 17th of March, I got into the hospital. And it was, it was quite tough because I, I arrived there and people dying everywhere. And the doctor said to you, to me, say, it's nothing we could get, do for you. Uh, you got pneumonia, you got virus, obviously. Uh, we can we can only give you paracetamol for the temperature. If mm -hmm. you body pull it through, fine. Otherwise, nothing will give you oxygen. Oxygen, and they gave me the maximum oxygen you can give, uh, because I could I couldn't breathe. It was horrendous. Uh, mm -hmm. After five days, I managed to come out. I wanted to come out, and I was fine. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, my, the test came back afterwards because the, the test take six days those days. Mm -hmm. I was negative. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the apparently 60, 40 percent of the tests in those days were absolutely inaccurate. Uh, also, because probably I, I, they took the test quite late, late on, but it was it was fun, and it took me a while to recover. Actually, I was at home for nearly two months, doing very little, and afterwards just start practicing and uh, learning new music and listening to a lot of music, uh, uh, and start teaching online. I taught my students non-stop all over the world uh, because everyone was locked down and I kept teaching online and slowly start building up my stamina um, mm -hmm. and now I feel okay. I went to I went on holidays. I went six weeks to Spain on holidays. That was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. And we came back uh, and now we, uh, next week we got we got project with the orchestra. We do the octet. Uh, in the CBSO Center we do for first time a small concert, two concerts on a Friday one hour each concert with public. We look with the social distances to see what happened. Mm -hmm. That's what I've been doing. I'm practicing and trying to keep fit and, and enjoy life. And I tell you, uh, something changed here because uh, I was working too hard last year. Mm -hmm. And when, you, when you're lying down in, a, in an ambulance and you don't know if you're going to see your kids or your family again, something here goes on and says, it's not worth it. You know, just, you know, we didn't, we don't need everything we're doing. You know, we are, we can live with very little. We don't need much. Uh, it's not worth working the way I was working. For that, I'm cutting down my students in Manchester this this year. I'm I'm, I'm doing quite. Well, I got quite a lot of students in Birmingham as well because I also teach in the Birmingham Conservatoire, and I'm cutting down quite a lot of my students in Manchester because every single day, every every single free day, I have to go to Manchester six o'clock in the morning and teach the whole day. It wasn't wasn't life. It's not a life. Mm -hmm. yeah. For that, something changed, and I'm trying to enjoy life and look. I mean, and learning new music, and you know, and looking things for the future, and looking for new projects. The problem is, uh, I have to cancel a version in Mexico, have to cancel a trip to Brazil, have to cancel a concert in Argentina, have to cancel a contemporary music in America next uh, February, a trip to, to Brazil next uh, June. Uh, so cancel now because nobody also nobody knows what's going to happen for so that it's difficult mm -hmm. to program anything you know mm -hmm. uh, it's a funny times it's a really difficult times mm -hmm. for that i'm i'm trying to keep, keep fit and learn new things and enjoying really enjoying practicing 
It's really nice. I, I, I recommend it, guys. <laughs> I really recommend it. It's really nice to practice <laughs> and to listen to music, you know, because I, I, I realized with Kathy we were discussing that day, you know, because we work so hard with music, music all the time, we don't listen to music. And suddenly, mm -hmm. you know, you learn to listen to music. And it's fantastic. Really having a great time. I really enjoyed the lockdown, actually. I was suffering. I, I feel, I feel a bad to say this because I know a lot of people having a lot, a lot of difficulties. But we are in a nice house. I got Netflix. I got music. I got my instruments. <laughs> you know, I'm having a great time. I got a cellar full of wine. You know, <laughs> but I don't need anything in life now. <laughs> Enjoy life. That, that's great to hear. Now. Yeah, that's yeah. great to hear. We, we just got a, a couple more minutes for maybe one more question. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions okay. quickly. So, um, okay. Paul was asked, Paul Dovey was asking whether you and Diego have performed the Beethoven Triple Concerto at all. No, no, yeah. but we, we would love to do that. We yeah. would love to ask him if it's, a, it's an invitation or what. <laughs> <laughs> if it's an invitation, it, it's on. Basically, it's not up to me. No, 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 no. <laughs> no we haven't done it, but we, we could do it. It's a great piece. I would love to. Well, why not? Yeah. That's a good idea. Something for the future, right? Eh? <laughs> yeah. Why uh, not? Just, yeah. Um, that was just a wrap, wrap round of the last question. Um, John was just asking, um, well, obviously, you told a little bit, but what, what are your interests outside of music? What. Um, uh, outside music, uh, I, 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 I watch a lot of TV, I love good TV, mm -hmm. <laughs> and football, football, yeah. football, I was desperate, the only thing I was desperate with during lockdown is no football, I couldn't believe it, you know, I think I have all this time and not football, you know, <laughs> I watch, I watch, I follow Spanish league, Italian league, Argentinian league, mm -hmm. English league, you know, my you wife is really, is really fed up. Teams or just yeah, like... my, uh, here in, in, in England, I'm following my United. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm, I'm a foreigner. I'm a foreigner. <laughs> <laughs> what do you expect? But my son, my son, who actually was my United for many, many years, he gave him, he gave up and he's Man City now. For, for the last 10 years, he became <laughs> Man City. <laughs> oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. What can you do? But uh, and I like football. I like I like uh, also I love the Premier League. I think the Premier League is fascinating, and and I like the, the because it's, anybody could beat anybody, and I love the way they play. I, I just I just love foot. I love football, football, football. football. Just oh, and sometimes I watch three Sundays and Saturdays. In this how I watch three matches a day. My wife is really fed up. So I'm going for a walk now. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so I'm going to watch a football. <laughs> That, that's that's my my hobby oh. well listen Eduardo thank you so much yeah. it's a pleasure for doing yeah, this. it's been so enjoyable that's um, a great pleasure guys great. Yeah. and you're right in some way you know locked there has been some good things about lockdown because yeah. it gave us the idea to do this and you yeah know, absolutely yeah um yeah and it's just it's been so lovely um to hear more about your life and and your music choices of course um, and it's yeah. It's well, it's a great pleasure. And look after yourself. It's in it this series. It this series. I mean, be careful with the virus because you never know the turn it could take. And I tell you, I was there. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. I saw yeah. two people dying beside me, and it's horrible. Yeah. And it's not fun. I mean, I couldn't breathe for four days. It was horrendous. But I, look after yourself. Well, yeah. 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 nice. Great to see you. Thank you.